Hey guys, it's Andong. Today we're talking about the amazing world of coconut milk based soups. You might have heard of Thai Tom Kha Gai soup or Malaysian laksa. Well, this one is like the love child between the two of those, except with a few extra twists I came up with myself. This is the second, no, second episode of Soup Season. Okay, first of all, there's a very good scientific explanation for why coconut milk based soups are so delicious. Coconut milk is a stable oil and water emulsion. It has up to 20% fat, which makes it rich and creamy, yes, but the advantage is not just texture, it's also its ability to absorb flavors. If I may oversimplify for a moment, water is great at taking on things like sweetness and saltiness, but oil is really good at absorbing and intensifying aromas and fragrances that water just doesn't carry very well. So a stable combo of these two makes the perfect vehicle for flavor. It is therefore not a big surprise that people in coconut growing regions have been grating and squeezing coconuts to get this magic creamy liquid and of course cook with it. One of the most famous examples would be a style of Thai soup called Tom Kha. You might have heard of it before. It's quite simple to make if you have the right ingredients and while you can switch out the proteins, the main citrusy floral and fish sauce packed flavor profile will pretty much stay the same. But right around the corner, most prominently perhaps in Malaysia, there's another spicy coconut milk based soup called laksa. Now laksa is actually a whole family of soups and in fact not all of them actually contain coconut milk but some of the most popular styles do. Laksa is a bit more difficult to define aside from the fact that it always comes with noodles. Its preparation is definitely more complex and the toppings and ingredients can vary a whole lot but that is what makes laksa so much fun if you ask me. With so much delicious background to work with, my goal for this video was to combine influences from both Tom Kha and laksa into one easy recipe that also doesn't rely too heavily on you know ingredients like galangal root or dry shrimps that might be very difficult and expensive to source for some of you guys but also you know they might go bad before you get to use them again so maybe not. Now with that being said one of the things I always love the most about laksa are all the fun toppings you can add and perhaps most of all fish balls or seafood balls something I always wanted to try making myself. The first ingredient I'm gonna add is simply shrimps. So these are raw and deveined and peeled shrimps. I bought them frozen and I thawed them in a little bit of cold water. And it's actually a good thing that they're still a little bit frosty and a, like semi frozen because we're gonna blend them and we want them to stay nice and cold. And the other thing we're gonna need is chicken. I decided to just go for chicken breast. It's lean, it's easy to work with, and you know, doesn't have any bones we need to get rid of or anything. So these two different proteins will be the base of our balls. And now we just need to season them. I'm gonna go with like a teaspoon of salt and also just a tablespoon of sugar to balance things out a bit. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, now he's gonna add MSG, right? Wrong. I know I like to add MSG to my food, but this is not a gimmick. I'm adding MSG when it helps, but Shrimp and chicken both have so much naturally occurring umami, there's no need. And a lot of times the fish balls you actually get somewhere in Asia will just be that, just meat and a little bit of seasoning. But I do like adding a little bit of spice to that. And you really don't need much. I just like to go with a little bit of five spice powder and a little bit of white pepper powder. And it has to be white pepper because it has a really specific taste. In terms of flavor, we're pretty much there and now we need to worry about texture. Now you could just blend this up and there are techniques with which you can get this type of meat mass like really sticky and workable, but there's also a simpler workaround. And that workaround is simply adding the right amount of starch. And now all we gotta do is turn this into a paste. Okay, this is looking pretty good, but it's still a pretty thick paste. So what we're gonna do to make this a little bit more tender and also to help our food processor along just a little bit is adding a bit of water and try to use like really, really cold water, like ice cold water. Cold water is always the best choice when you're trying to turn meat into a paste. Now we can give this one last pass to make it super smooth. Did you see this? Uh, I think this is about as good as it's gonna get with a food processor. There are manual techniques that involve, you know, taking the, the, the paste and slapping it against the table and stuff, which like develops certain proteins or whatever. We're not gonna mess with that today. We are keeping it simple with a just processed paste like that. Now we're gonna get to the fun part of making shrimp balls. 
which involves touching shrimp paste with your hands. You're also gonna need a spoon, and while you could use any spoon, I highly recommend getting an Asian spoon like this. They're just perfect for the job, you're gonna see. And now, very importantly, wet your hands or your gloves as well as your spoon. The paste should stick a lot less. Oh, look at that, come on, yeah. Eventually your paste hand is gonna get sticky, there's not much you can do about that, but at least try to keep the spoon wet. So I'm definitely noticing that using a small amount of paste in your left hand is a lot easier than taking a whole handful. And now look at this. While I was making them, I was struggling, I was thinking, oh my god, they look terrible, this is not working. But now, here I am with a bowl full of chicken shrimp balls, and they actually look pretty decent. Now, obviously, these need to be cooked, pre-cooked. Fortunately, that is not very difficult. All you gotta do is carefully take those, transfer them to a pot of warm water, doesn't need to be boiling. Now we just gotta slowly let those come up to a simmer. Okay, now the moment your water comes up to the boil, you wanna set your stove to medium low and set your timer for eight minutes. That's usually when my balls are done. <laughs> oh man, this is so difficult. And make sure the water is not rapidly boiling. See, mine is boiling, so I'm adding a little bit of cold water to just kind of tame it. Just make sure to maintain a low simmer. And what you can do just to be sure that they have actually cooked through is you take a slightly bigger ball, a pair of scissors, and you just cut that open. Look inside and you're gonna see they are perfectly cooked through. And if they're cooked through, obviously that means they're done. And this, my friends, is a beautiful bowl of balls. One of my favorite things about Asian style meatballs or fish balls has always been that, yes, they do have a great amount of flavor themselves, but they're even better at absorbing all the flavors that surround them, let's say in a hot pot or in a soup. But in order to get there, we actually need to first pack our soup itself with tons and tons of flavor. And to achieve that, I wanna borrow another technique from laksa, which is making a, let's say, curry paste, which, you know, in Malaysia they call it rempa. The great thing is, once you make a rempa, you can actually use it as a flavor base for tons of Southeast Asian style dishes. Here's how I like to make my lazy type of curry paste. I'm gonna start with lemongrass, and what you wanna do is remove the outer parts, and then I like to cut off the very end of the bottom part, as well as the sort of woody, grassy tops. And then this is kind of the good part that you wanna use for the paste. And by the way, little pro tip, if you buy too much lemongrass to cook, this stuff freezes pretty well, I think. Cut this up into medium-sized segments, and then we're adding those into a small food processor. So the lemongrass is kind of our main hero aromatic, but of course there are many more. I'm also gonna use around a thumb of ginger. Here's a whole peeled shallot. Very rough chunks are totally fine. We just wanna help our food processor along a little bit. Then over here I have two fresh chilies. I just like to cut off the ends. The type of aroma you get from fresh chilies, aside from, of course, spiciness, is actually pretty different from dried chilies, which is why I'm also gonna add about a tablespoon of dried chili flakes. And then there's one extremely untraditional addition, <laughs> uh, but I like to use it because it's full of umami and a little bit of tanginess, which is tomato paste. Last but not least, a little pinch of salt to just kind of bring everything together. And now let's turn this into a paste. Smells really good, but this is not fine enough yet. Try getting it as fine as possible. It's scraped on the sides of the food processor. Maybe if I add a tiny splash of water, it could work even better. And blend some more. <sighs> okay, this is looking pretty fine and pasty. I don't think it's gonna get a ton better than this. So that's right with that. I'm pretty happy with this actually. So this is our paste. Looks pretty good, smells even better. Obviously this is a lot more than we're gonna need for this recipe, but that's okay. I'm gonna use however much I need, and then the rest of the stuff will last you for, you know, at least a week or something in the fridge, or you can put this in an ice cube tray and you get sort of like red curry cubes that will last for a good few weeks in the freezer. Okay, so the chicken and shrimp balls, as well as the addition of rempa are both clearly inspired by laksa. We're also gonna be adding rice noodles because, you know, let's be honest, who doesn't love a good noodle soup? But for the, you know, soupy part itself, I'm actually gonna be leaning a lot more on the Thai Tom Ka technique, which, you know what? Believe it or not, 
That is actually the easy part. Before we start making the soup, there are a few little things we have to prep real quick. First, noodles. Now, pomka soup definitely has no noodles traditionally, as far as I know, but laksa certainly has. And that's kind of what inspired me to use some. So these are rice noodles. And all we're gonna do is cover them with just boiling hot water. Second thing is like a good handful or two of bean sprouts, which I have washed, but I like to kind of blanch them before I use them in the soup, just so you know, they soften up a little bit. And these will be as good as blanched by the time we're done. And the third and last thing we gotta prep is this. So this is dashi broth. You might know it from Japanese cuisine, which I'm just gonna add to my measuring cup. Cover it with about half a liter of boiling water, and this is just gonna steep like a tea and turn into dashi broth. If you can find the dashi tea bags at your Asian grocery store, then go for them. You can also buy dashi powder. It's gonna work just fine. And with all of that good stuff prepped, making the actual soup is actually a breeze. And straight to your soup pot, add a little bit of oil. And to that, we're gonna add a little bit of our homemade curry paste. Now, how much you add is pretty much up to you, depending on how spicy you like it and things like that and how intense. And now quickly, before this burns, stir this around and make sure all the nice aromas from the curry paste are infused into the oil. Once everything starts smelling nice and toasty, this is the time to add your stock. Obviously the addition of dashi is kind of just my thing. You can totally use chicken stock, veggie stock, or even just water if you like. While this is warming up, we can take care of other flavor additions. And the first one will be lime. Pretty much all the recipes you'll find online will tell you to add lime leaves. Instead of using lime leaves, I'm just gonna use the zest of a lime that I'm removing with a peeler, and then we're gonna drop that into the soup. Later on, we'll also use some of the lime juice, but this way you get really close to what you would get from lime leaves, but you know, without buying the whole thing. Okay, now we got the umami from the dashi, we got the floral zesty note from the lime leaves, we got, of course, you know, tons of aromatics from the curry paste, and now we're gonna use fish sauce for even more umami, but also, quite importantly, tons of salt. Okay, now to complement the ridiculous amount of flavor and umami we have in here, we're also gonna add a little bit of brown sugar, which is really the great unifier for everything here. And now, of course, the one ingredient that can not be missing, and that is coconut milk. Try to get good coconut milk, not from a can, but from one of these little cartons. And also just check the ingredients. The less additives there are in there, the better it's gonna taste. I just love the look of that red oil swimming on top of a rich coconut broth. Now we can actually start adding our proteins and I'm gonna start with mushrooms because fun fact, mushrooms don't overcook. The more traditional route would probably be adding oyster mushrooms, but don't know if you knew this, but I'm actually not a huge fan of mushrooms. So I like to add button mushrooms, which have texture, but taste like nothing. And that just means they're gonna absorb all of that beautiful flavor without adding mushroom taste. And then the second protein will be our shrimp balls. Obviously you could just go for pieces of chicken breast or something, but you know, it's just so much more fun and more delicious to add these balls. By the way, obviously our shrimp balls, they're pre-cooked. So the reason we're adding them into the soup now is to, you know, just warm them up a little bit. I have one last addition I like to make, which is pak choy. Not traditional at all, but I just think that this soup is kind of missing a little bit of a veggie element and pak choy, you can never go wrong with pak choy, can you? Okay, the soup itself is now done, but there's one last touch we need to add, which is, you know, a squeeze of lime. Sourness is definitely a very important part of this flavor profile, but I'm not sure why, but I definitely like adding it last. You don't need that much. I think the juice of half a lime is totally enough. So the way I intended this to work is to grab a couple of those noodles, then to top them with bean sprouts, and then pour the soup over them. But this is the soup season series, and I have a bit of a different plan. You might remember in the last episode, I did not have a table. I made a whole mess. Not, not gonna happen this time. So you might be wondering, what the hell is he doing? Well, I have an answer for you. This is soup season. We're trying to find the best soups in the world. And I think the only way to actually taste a soup and to tell how good it is, is to try it on a freezing cold day in the great outdoors. First, the noodles. Now we're gonna top this with our blanched mung bean sprouts. And now, of course, our pièce 
de résistance. No soup could be complete without toppings, if you ask me. I'm sorry to probably like a quarter of my viewers, um, but I'm gonna add tons of cilantro because cilantro and a spicy coconut milk soup, yes, please. By the way, I'm curious, do you think cilantro tastes like soap? Like I genuinely want to know how many people think that. So please comment below. But now, chilies. And now the long awaited moment, I can finally try this soup. I am very ready for this. Success. Oh yeah. Oh my God. This soup. I'm almost tempted to just conclude this series early because that soup is next level. It's rich, it's creamy, it's savory, it's spicy, it's sour, it's fragrant, it's everything. The broth is silky. That is the perfect word to describe this. Umami level on a scale from one to 10, it's up there. Seriously, using dashi stock for tom kha soup or something like that is a game changer. The spice is starting to hit me now. I think the spice level is perfect. It's exactly where I need it to be. The noodles here, by the way, are an amazing addition. They're so good. Like normally, a Thai Tom Kha Gai soup is actually eaten a little bit like a curry with rice on the side. But you know, the noodles, they just kind of work better if you look at it as a soup. And now, of course, the thing I'm most proud of, the chicken shrimp balls. They're so tender. The texture is almost like tofu. It's just a little hint of that five spice and white pepper. And you know, living in Germany, we don't have access to all the rich seafood that people in Southeast Asia might have. And these chicken shrimp balls, at least they pay respect to the seafood that's supposed to be in here. <laughs> so good. If you don't make the soup, at least make these shrimp balls. Mushrooms are also great. And you know what? Even though there's chili in the curry paste, adding fresh chilies on top definitely recommend it. It like, they have like a slightly different type of aroma than any kind of chili that you cook off. Much, much recommended. Also, quite importantly, this is the lime zest, which of course you're not supposed to eat. I, I'm, I'm just fertilizing, don't, don't worry. If you ask me, using lime zest and lime juice in this is a totally adequate replacement for lime leaves. Don't stress about lime leaves. Don't have a bag of lime leaves at home that you never use. Critique, almost none. Seriously, almost none, except that when it comes to pak choy, don't overcook it. This one has stayed in the soup for quite a long time. But other than that, honestly, amazing. For now, let me just say, I seriously hope you give my take on coconut milk based soups a try. I think this one is incredible. If you try it, make sure to tag me on Instagram and show me what your soup looked like. I always love to see those. And with that being said, thank you guys for watching and I'm gonna see you in the next one.